one, and we are we are recording. We are recording live with Janie McGill. Hello. Janie McGill, ta- epi- not episode three, appearance number three in the podcast. Hello. Yes, enjoy the icebreaker, which you hadn't done before. Yep. And I'm very glad that you're back in the studio. First time in the studio, isn't it? Yeah, I love it. I think it's awesome. It looks going to get better. It's, it's a car <laughs> really crash. It's a car crash. I mean, it's a nightmare at the minute, but it will be. It will be improved. And thank you for bringing Sid and Winston the dogs. Absolutely Very fun. glad. Very glad when guests bring dogs. Um, right. So I was re- talking off air. I said I've got something interesting to tell you. I don't know why. It's I've got. It's got no relevance to anything we've just been discussing. The icebreaker. Or anything we're going to discuss. Isn't However, Vladimir the Great. Okay, right. I learned this in. Uh, two days ago, Vladimir the Great in the 10th century, around 966, something like that, he decided, because he wanted to get a, basically wanted to marry a Byzantine princess. He wanted access to the riches and the, and the, and the good fortune that By- Byzantine had at the time. He saw that as a way of marrying into the family who ran it. They said he could marry a, 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 one of the daughters as long as he converted his entire people to Christianity. And he went, yep. And he converted everyone yeah. that he ruled, hundreds of thousands of people, maybe maybe millions, maybe hundreds of thousands. He told them all to convert to Christianity and they all converted to Christianity so he could marry a woman. So what were they before? Uh, I don't know, but it, I don't... They, it was like they, Henry VIII. Yeah, they, they didn't have... They didn't have uh, so his people at the time. They were like these are Slavs, like Slav, like Slav people, like pre-Russia. Yeah. Uh, they didn't have their own. They weren't united by religion. Okay. They didn't really have. They had different religions. It was just different things. It wasn't like a, a national thing. However, when he did that, it that is like that's what sparked part of the spark towards to what became Russia now. So they were united under one ruler, one nation, one religion. Interesting. Clever on the girl's family's part. Yeah, I, yeah, I suppose. I mean, imagine doing that. Because now. that's got to be that's got to be it, isn't it? It was all tactics back then. He was he wasn't marrying her for love, was he? He was marrying her for power. One yeah. would assume, because yeah. that's what. That's such a. Because that's what what. That's such a generalist comment. Because that's what people in power do. They just want more power. But then yeah, he... Yeah. But then, so maybe... Oh, I don't know, I'm confusing myself now. He married her because he wanted to get into the family for power. Yeah. And then her family said, yes, you can marry into us, but you've got to convert all your people into our people, essentially. Interesting, yeah. So yeah. who... Who got the good deal there? I don't know. Both did. Both got what they wanted. Well, I tell you who didn't get a good deal. I tell you who didn't get a good deal. The daughter. Well, I don't think she her? got a good deal. Well, she was a pawn. Yeah, I wonder I wonder what Vlad was like. I wonder if he was a nice guy. I don't know, man. I've never even heard of him, to be honest. Vladimir the Great? No. You've never heard of Vladimir heard of the Great? Alexander the Great, but not Vladimir, no. I mean, I'm saying it like I, I know all about him. I, only, <laughs> I, was, re- I was reading about like the, how Russia came about, based on a, 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 okay. um, a, uh, a mini essay last week on like how Russia came to be as it. No, not Russia. How that how that whole region is the way it is today. Yeah. I'm quite ignorant to all of that, to be honest. I'm trying I, not to be. Yeah, I am ignorant to it. I'm afraid. I don't yeah. know the historical. Well, I think the thing is, is that I have strong opinions about things at the minute. And I want to be able to explain them. Yeah. Well, well, not explain to people, but explain to myself. No, fair enough. I understand that. You know, so one of the things I've been bandying around a few times when Ukraine's come up into conversation is, it's a bit of a pointless point, is, oh, a significant, a significant proportion of Ukraine are ethnically Russian. Makes but, sense. But, yeah, but, what, but, it? but in me saying that, what's the point I'm making? There's no, I've said it a couple of times. And also, it's not, it's not really true. The whole of the whole of Ukraine, uh, like people who are from, like genetically from that region, they're they're Slavs. They're all the same people. It's pre-Russia. No, the point I'm making yeah. is I've been saying that, not understanding anything behind it. <laughs> you know, I, I've just said it a couple of times, but it's a fact that isn't really. It's a pointless fact. Has no bearing on the, 
I know. Anyway, anyway, so that's why that's what I try and do. Read the, read these things. I think it's important. You know, when you're discussing stuff yeah. publicly, like we are. Yeah. To back yourself yeah. and to have the evidence. Yeah. And not on, on yeah. hearsay. Yeah, so I'd like to say things that are correct as opposed to realising I said things that are incorrect and in retrospect come back and fix them. But then it's yeah. also probably only correct in, in a biased sense that whoever, you know, if you read a particular book or something, it's by an author and I believe that even if, you know, however unbiased you want to be, you're probably always going to have a bias even without realising it. Yeah, but you have to have biases, right? Yeah. You have, I think, yeah, I think that's what people, like we were talking a little bit on the podcast about society and parts of society. What's the seaside going on in my ear? Rain on it's rain outside. Oh, is it rain? Yeah. Um, uh, about society and different parts of society not getting on with each other, um, and that's a lot down to. I mean, we talked about male and female, right? Mm. As an example, but you have to have like prejudice and biases. Like, there's a reason those emotions and those things exist. It's because they uh, necessitate. E survival, like yeah. evolutionary. That's what. That's why we have them. That's why we look. At, we can look at a. We can look at a, an animal we've never seen before, and know that thing. I'm not going anywhere near that thing because it looks dodgy. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a, a baby. Like babies are afraid of certain animals without even know what they are. Like they don't understand them. And those those kind of examples. Yeah. And animals are afraid of humans that they've never even you know, seen before and run away. Why? There's no reason other yeah. than they recognise it and have a inbuilt bias or prejudice. But then we do soak those up from our parents and, and what's around us as well, don't we? Yeah, so you find that someone who's uh, a mother who's scared of a dog, highly likely her children will be scared of a dog as well. Or yeah. bees or something like that. Yeah. It's quite interesting to watch. That would be a mix of, I mean, that example, though, that, could, that would probably be a mix of genetics and learned behaviour. Yeah, or experience of being bitten or... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think... It's a bad thing. I mean, it frightens me. Well, because I've got dogs, it frightens me when children are right up in their faces. Because while my dogs are very well behaved, if some kid smacks them in the face, well, I'd want to bite his nose as well. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it makes me nervous. With um, Anyway, that's a different... Yeah, some different people story. don't give a shit. Some, some people don't care about their dogs cutting them out. No, they so or, or their children. Or the children. Yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah. Yeah. What was, uh, what was it like when you were a child? Could you, could you cut about? What was it? What was your upbringing like? Chaos. Why? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I kind of assumed that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? Wanna... I mean, you say that, but like you, you know, you mentioned uh, your dad in the iceberg. You mentioned him on both previous podcasts, and uh, like he sounded like an incredible, he was an incredible man, so I can't imagine, I mean, I, I like to think it was a safe chaos, was it, or not, what was it like? Mm. It, <laughs> <laughs> it was, um, well, I mean, we did what we wanted, really, it was sort of, it was almost, you know, if you bunk off school, there was almost like a, that's my girl. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, it was a bit... He was a bit of a rebel, you know, and he was a law unto himself and he did what he wanted and no one really, you know, told him what to do or anything. And I think that we inherited that a little bit mm. and that's probably why I was not very good at being employed. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and that's not, that's not strictly true, actually, because I, I, I was, if I... If there was someone that I liked and that gave me the autonomy that I needed, I'd, I would go to the end of the world for them. But if I was micromanaged or, you know, whatever, I just could not bear it. Just get out, you know, just leave me alone. Mm. Um, yeah, well, it was chaos. So he would take us out of school if he wanted, if he wanted to go away on holiday. Um, but he was very impulsive as well. So you never really knew what was going to happen. Whether you know you might you might end up in Devon f for for lunch because there was a restaurant that he fancied going Where did you to grow up? in Surrey. Yeah. So he grew up in London, in um, in uh, Battersea, and then he didn't see. You know, it was the it was the, it was the Badlands uh, in London <laughs> in that time as well. Jesus. <laughs> Are you <all> right? <coughs> <coughs> 
<coughs> Excuse me. You need a pat on the back. No, go on, you're right. Sorry, people. I'm choking <laughs> on liquid. Go on. How the hell is that? Go on. All right? Yeah. Good. <coughs> oh. Yes, continue. It was the Badlands. <laughs> yeah, and so he didn't want us growing up um, in that environment. So he took us out to the countryside um, and remained working in town. So I didn't see him a huge amount, to be honest, in my in my younger my younger years, because he went to live in Las Vegas as well to run a company over there. So, although we did spend two years there as well. So, wait, Las Vegas. Yeah. What was that like? How old? How old? It was you awesome. Went there? Uh, I was first time we were there. I was six, um, and the second time I was there, I was about ten. Have you been back since? I think I last went back when I was sixteen. So, oh, twenty four. How old am I? Don't give your age away. Ladies don't do that. 20... <laughs> it's debatable. <laughs> it's debatable. Unless you're going to lie. Um, no, it's got to be over 20 years ago. Um, this is what I mean. This is oh, the You can hear it, uh, Sid, whining at me. Um, so, yeah, it was... It was I, I don't know. It felt a bit lawless, to be honest. And actually, my education was quite far behind. Um, even though I was at... Um, I was at a private school in England, and we went to a private school in Las Vegas. But my, um, yeah, my maths was very, very poor compared to their standard over there. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I had to get a tutor. What are you growling at? I had Go to on. get a tutor to to catch up, sort of thing. Yeah. It's gonna get raucous oh, here sorry. now. Come on, dogs, I'll do it. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> Do you know what? Jared's got to whip it. Is that a whip it? Yes. Yeah, yeah, Jared's got to whip it. And Jared's whip it does the same thing, but to me. Oh, when I really? go around with Jared, that dog, that it's dog. on you. On me. Pounces on me. <laughs> gets really horny. And it only happens around me. Oh, Jared. Yeah, he goes crazy. It's a, it's a ginger. I'm not sure. Like, I've, been around, <laughs> the, I've been around him since he was a, a puppy. puppy. No, I mean, not constantly. Oh, like, it's I've, a, a dominance but... thing, I suppose, isn't it? Do you reckon? The dog humping me is a dominance thing. I thought that, so when you mentioned about Winston might sit on my foot, yeah. that's a dominance thing. When they sit and lean against you or, or put is their it? weight on you, that's dominance, yeah. Is it? Yeah, it's an ownership thing, yeah. I'm sure I read oh, that somewhere. okay. I'm sure I read that somewhere. Was, when you, when you were in Las Vegas, 16, was, yeah. was, it, was it seedy? I've never been. Um, well, I, I wasn't really exposed to that side of things. You know, I wasn't going to the, the sort of titty bars and stuff, so I didn't see it. Um, but the gambling, like my dad was a big card player oh. as well, so he did a lot of cards and blackjack and whatever. Um, no, we just had fun. You know, it was like we went to the shows and but it was very suburban. If you're not, you know, you're not living on the strip or downtown, you're out in the, the sort of gated, we were in the gated sort of community like like what you see on the telly really you know first we lived on a on a big lake and then the next time we were on a big golf course and it was all you're all penned in sort of thing and there's security so was he working there? yeah he was running a water purification company that his friend had invented ultimately turned the pools green but <laughs> but it was good they floated it i think when he was when he was there. But I think back and I just think, Jesus, man, he was only, was he 36 or something at the time? Yeah. You know, and I was just thinking, Successful Christ alive. Owner. Yeah. But a roof, you know, a roofer from a left, left school at 10 or something. And just, I don't know, just had massive balls and a massive desire to sort of provide for his family and a massive craving for a thirst and adventure, you and know? A massive brain. Oh yeah, shri a proper manoeuvrer. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you have your first job out there then? If you were sixteen, is that your first? No, no. That well, I only went to visit when I was sixteen. Oh, I didn't live. Right. So I was only oh, a baby. Sorry, sorry, no, I was sorry. a baby yeah, when I lived yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we were just at school. I would like to go. I'd like to go just to see it. But I, I, I like gambling. I don't gamble because I like gambling. Yeah, gotcha. You know, I do enjoy. It. I love. I love playing cards. I like betting on the rugby and stuff occasionally, like infrequently. But man, but I would like to go out there and see it. But it'd have to be one of those where I just take out ridiculous money and I'm going to go on like a good time and be prepared to lose it all. But 
you know, um, sort of a bucket list thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you go for it. Maybe you could get one of those little travel cards which you put the credit on or something and leave everything oh, else at home. I'd find a way to get that. <laughs> I would find a way. I mean, talking about money management, honestly, all of the methods that you, I've tried over the years just to be better at handling money, you know, those ones, like card limits and stuff. I mean, not even credit card, like debit card, card yeah. limits, things like that. I find a way around it. I find yeah. a way around it. Find... Come on then. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> What's the latest one? <laughs> yeah, goodness me. Yeah, I mean, um, <clears throat> that's probably, do you know what, that's probably the only thing, decent thing coming out, of, coming out of the situation at the minute in the UK with yeah. how hard things are. It's just definitely, there's no choice but to be more careful with money and be yeah. more conscious of what you're spending, where I think uh, it could be a bit more loosey-goosey beforehand. I don't know, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. I've, I have to say that I've always been insanely frugal <coughs> for the last, I don't know, 10 years probably, only because I've, I don't really do, I don't really go out, I don't, everything that I've ever made has sort of gone into something, you know, gone into the, the desert trip or is going into my new business ideas and equipment and camera equipment, so I don't, but that, I enjoy that. You're really, you're very driven and goal oriented, aren't you? I think so. I'm a tick boxer. Yeah. I'm a tick boxer. But what about focus though? So you're able to keep your eyes on something and, and go, I mean, obviously a man was a huge task, a huge task. Yeah. Oh, not a man. The, the, uh, it wasn't just a man. It wasn't just a man, was it? The, uh, the empty quarter. But that was a huge undertaking over, what? That was years of prep. Still and not finished. Pre and post. Oh, obviously, I think you've got going on now, but... Can you mention, can you mention the production? Yeah, of course. You've got the film. Yeah. You've got the film being released of it. Um, back to the question. You know, because you, you said your dad was, he was all, he was all very impulsive, what you said. Yeah. So do you not have that trait from him then? Yes, I do. Terribly. How do you, you manage it? Um, I think the way that I see it is that if, <clears throat> if I chuck enough shit, something will stick. So I have... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I have lots of ideas which I throw, like you'll see, I've got a YouTube channel and li honestly, it's just yeah, right. appalling, but it's a great... Um, what are you using it for? I, I, well, nothing at the moment. Well, quite a few things in the past. I just yeah. thought, you know, oh, I'll try this, oh, I'll try that. And it's just a, a series of unfinished business. On the channel? Yeah. Right, okay. And I leave it there just to remind <coughs> myself, you know, okay, actually maybe you're moving on to something that can keep your interest and your focus. So basically it's a huge um, case of trial and error with everything that I do. And if I, if I suddenly get fixated on it, then I know I'm onto something and then I'll work to the point where I can't work anymore. And I'm, I'm there now actually, where I'm just, my head is blown essentially because I've, spinning so many plates which I and I think is I love them all the plates that I'm spinning at the moment so how are you gonna how so how do you decide which plate to set down or which plates to set down well the, I don't want to set any down at the moment that I've got so why do you see it as a concern then um because I can't because I can't stop I burn myself out but then I listen to the burnout and I let it happen and then I'll go right right here we go again I don't think that's the best strategy it might not be, but it's worked. Yeah. It's worked so far and it's kind of just, you know, sometimes I think, well, I'm so excited and focused on this. I'm just <coughs> going to go for it because I don't know if that's coming back again. So I've just got to, I got to take advantage of it. So I've tried the sort of nine till five. It doesn't work. I'm a night owl. And if I just get an inspiration. You're quite arty, to... aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, I was always arty. You had dabbled in the art and like, I've got to say the arts then, but in, you know, creating for money. Yes, I am at the moment. Well, funnily enough, I was going to go to art college and then obviously, um, you know, the outside influences of parents and things, you, know, you will never make any money being an interior designer. <coughs> so I didn't. Um, but then it came back round um, after I broke my back and I started an art gallery with a girlfriend of mine. So we converted a big horse box into a travelling gallery and drove it round to the race courses and that. And that was really <coughs> great fun. Um, it, it was a bit sort of hand to mouth. When it was good, it was good. When it was bad, it was really bad. Um, and then, so I was selling other people's art, but then I got into life modelling. So I thought... Well, actually, it was for a bit of cash as well, actually. What do you mean, life modelling? Naked. 
for artists. You were the model? I was the model. Oh, really? <laughs> I quite, I quite enjoyed... I'm laughing because I thought you'd be doing the painting. <laughs> no, no, I yeah. was doing the modelling. But it, it was actually, I really, I started to get very into I mean, it. Because yeah, it I, was... I, mean, I mean, you'd be doing the painting because you'd want naked models to, to, to look at, as opposed to you not being suitable for new modelling. I'm just... Be... <laughs> I'm just I, feel like, I feel like the way that came across was <laughs> you. <laughs> no. Uh, no, I did that because... Um, no, for a bit of extra cash when things were hard, um, but also I quite got into it because it, it was taking me to loads of cool places and I was meeting really cool people as well. Um, and there was, I, I was doing this aerial silks course, you know, the circus stuff as well. And then I saw an... You were what? Aerial silks, you know, when you're yeah. in like Cirque du Soleil. Well, I was thinking about running away to the circus and tried that out. It was really difficult. So you were training to do that? Yeah, but I, that was like something else. And then I got this job God. as a life model. And it was this commission that a sculptor was trying to do where he was, um, he, he was com commissioned by a Russian lady to have <coughs> a model mm -hmm. climbing up a rope in her hallway, like climbing to the light. And so because I'd been doing this aerial silks thing, I was really good on the ropes at the time. So I was the perfect... So Model you were hanging on, the, on, hanging on the rope while he was painting? And you were Sculpting. naked? Sculpting. and you were naked? Bollock naked. And then... <laughs> and there's, there's peacocks and Bengal cats and all sorts running around. What do you mean? Was Why just, was there animals? What? Because it was on this... Um, it was on a big estate. Like, you know, one of the eccentric sort of stately home kind of things. And yeah. this artist was in the studio of the garden. At, at the, the customers, home. at the cust and it was, was that where they No, were... it wasn't the customers, oh, no. But right. it just happened, and that, and all of that stuff, I was going to this weird and wonderful stuff, and I really enjoyed it. Was that the first time you'd done life modelling? No. Nude modelling? No. Well, tell me about the first time. Oh, no, you want to tell that story then? No, it's fine. It was a, it was a class, and you got the dirty old men in there. <laughs> so it was... Well, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, Tell you got the dirty so old men in there. You like... explain to me how that came about. So it's just, hang on, it's just you. In fact, talk me through this. Talk me through how this came about, and step by step to the point where you are naked in front of a bunch of blokes. Oh my no, god! No, it's not all blokes. Oh right, it's a mixture. It's a mixture, but you know the little pervy ones sneak in, don't they? I don't know. I've, I've never done oh. it. <laughs> I, I want to know. Tell me. Okay, so you, so there was a a, a life model job website i can't remember what it's called now it's a long time ago but there was this um this website and you'd look for jobs local jobs and if there was something there you'd ring them up and say i'm available um they often wanted fat people and i was actually very slim and and toned at that time but i still got a few jobs anyway went along to this place i think it was it, it was near sutton i think and um like a little village hally type thing and you go in and you sort of you know there's a little box in the middle that you have to do contortiony things um and, and you might do you know pose for five minutes pose for two minutes half an hour pose so you've got to think it and, was actually and they tell you what poses to no do. oh you as a life model have to contort your body into <coughs> You've got, to think, oh. you've got to think from the artist's point of view, what shape, what shadows, what... So do you get any steer on what kind of thing they're after? What kind of pose they're after? Nothing at all? You might sometimes, but it's more, as the life model, that's, that's your job, is to, to give them something interesting where oh. you look up. And I see, I assumed it would be you get instruction in, yeah, right, we want you to sit like this or stand like this and if you could, that's what I thought it would be, as opposed you, to... You might, you would do that maybe with an art, with a solo artist, so I did right, that okay. with a an oil painter and the same thing, I went to this most beautiful house in Kent, I think it was Kent, and it was, you know, a big old Victorian manor kind of thing and a beautiful garden and all of that and he had an incredible studio. But those were long poses, like two hours sometimes. And I tell you what, Hugh, that was hard. Imagine. That was like proper, proper endurance. You know, <laughs> yeah. like sometimes you're just in agony and you're just thinking, God, how long can I, how long can I hold this? But you just do. And it became a competition for me. 
it was yeah surprising that being to be comfortable enough to do that as well around a stranger or strangers and as a lady i think i was just pushing myself i was mm. being i wanted to be uncomfortable and i wanted to i don't know what i was trying to do i think <laughs> it was just pushing boundaries and maybe what people say i was actually thinking about it the other day because there was no difference to what I was doing than to what page three models do, really. It's just how you dress it. There isn't, is there? Yeah, interesting. It's like being, you know, it's like being yeah. the pissed homeless alcoholic on the street or the, the pissed guy in a suit in the city. There's actually no difference between the two. It's just how they're dressed. Interesting. Yeah. That's an interesting observation, I can't take that. That's my brother's. Hmm... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, did you get, ever get any vi bad vibes from any of the uh, the customers? Ah, uh, I did have one who wanted me to hit him. I drew the line there. Just so wanted me to. There was no art involved then. I don't think so. No. How did? When did you find out he you... wanted you to hit him? Um, he asked <coughs> me. So you were there. No, no, no. This was this was like via email and stuff. Right. So he was like, I, "Okay, I just need you to practice hitting me really hard," and I was just like, "It's going to give me eighty quid an hour, so I'm not." <laughs> I was kind of like, hmm. um, but then I was just like, "No, it's too. It's not for me." That is strange, isn't it? Weird and oh, wonderful yeah, people out there. I wonder yeah. what motivates you to want to be hit like that. So, so for the life modeler, it sounds like it was a particular, predominantly a particular class that we would be paying to do this, to, to paint nudes. What do you mean class? Societal class. I mean, you're talking about mansions and stuff it being done at. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a lot of cost. Yeah, I suppose. So. I can't imagine, you know, I can't imagine, wait, wait, who do you know as a, who do you know personally that's paid someone, paid for someone, apart from the people who paid you, paid someone to, to be a life model because they want to paint them. I mean, in your, in our, in our, I like, I we're do, in the same because it's class, my, right? It's mm, yeah, I'm in okay. that or was in that realm, so it was normal for Maybe me. Maybe I just blinkered to it. Well, there's life modelling classes all over the place. Yeah, if you just it, it, there's Facebook groups. I wonder how much of it is just people want to get the rocks off just for a kink. As oh, massively. To, I'd like to if it, I'd like to be able to I'd like to save a class of them and say right, all oh, turn your you've been here for an hour. Everyone turn your Turn your canvas round and have a look at the canvas and see who's done nothing. Or see who's see who's in there just like with the crayon that's just done some scroll. Yeah. You know, go you, you yeah. bastard, get yeah. out, pinged. You're not you for painting, are you? <laughs> you know, you know the ones that aren't there for the painting. How do you know? Because uh, you just know. Come on, tell me. No, you, there's a vibe. So I know how to man. mask it when I go to the next. A... <laughs> <laughs> no, there is a vibe. There's is sort there? Of, yeah, I, I, you know, I don't. I don't want to like judge or whatever, but you, you do. You... Well, come on, what are the signals? Well, it's just a bit creepy. It's just creepy vibes. The way they look, the way they look. Oh, okay. Yeah, and just a bit, I, don't, I just look a bit pervy. You know, some people do just look a bit pervy. <laughs> they do. I agree. They do. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, I agree. Pervy people. And looks like a duck's, what is it? Looks like a duck, smells like a duck? Looks like a rat, smells like a rat. Probably is, is a rat. Part, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I don't know if I could bring myself to do that. You know, I think it'd have to be more money. It is more now than what it was. Oh, don't certainly. tell me that. But that was it's, it was like that. twenty quid an hour, I think now. How much? Twenty. That's not a lot. It was ten an hour back then. Oh, that's less than what I thought it would be. Then I but then I well, suppose. Yeah. No, but that, then I suppose that's for a class. Where I did <coughs> do some, I did do some um, modelling for a a photographer in Richmond Park and that was quite exciting because you're you're sort of you know climbing trees naked and in the public yes in the public in the daytime <laughs> yes. did you get passers by coming no we didn't but you're always looking out for them mm. it's a funny thing yeah it's a weird, it's a funny one really but I, I, he got he got some beautiful pictures i must say he worked in black and white and i do love black and white oh i think you've posted well, some yeah. of the news a, while, a, yeah. a couple of years back, I remember now. Yeah, yeah, I remember now. He yeah, got things. Oh, okay, right. But he died. <laughs> <Jenny sadly. McGill. laughs> what was that? He died. Oh, I no. was really, yeah, I was sad. I was sad about that. Um, but yeah, so that was a that was a time. I think I 
I was just trying to, I think I was just trying to work out who I was. Did it help? Did yeah. it make you more resilient? I think I was pretty resilient already, but yeah, I suppose it, yeah, it does. Did, did and it... I think, ah, oh, i tell you what else there was to it as well. I became a lot more... Um, after my accident, because I was in hospital for three weeks, being bathed and, you know, oh, no. all nasty yeah. s stuff, you sort of become, you have a very different view of your body after that, or I certainly did. Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah. And that actually, I wasn't so prudish anymore. I was a bit like, because you couldn't be a prude in there. You just couldn't, you know, it's like spread your legs, you know, lift up that, whatever. And it was really... Um, degrading in a way but then at the same time you're so grateful for the people that are doing it for you and looking after you um so i think i i started viewing myself slightly differently after that and i also became very obsessed with the legacy part where i because i'd chosen not to have children <coughs> i wanted to sort of remain in art as but maybe that was just me rationalizing things because i just needed money and i could say i don't know I don't know, but there was definitely a thing of sort of what what stays with us forever, and it generally is art. Hmm. What do you mean stays with us forever? In what way? What do, What do you mean? As in, as as I mean, it lasts. You know, it's a legacy. So, if I don't have children and I die, like all of this is for nothing. <clears throat> it feels to me. Is it? Well, it. I don't know. I don't know if it is or it is. I think it's different for other people, but it's that's what gives me my motivation to do things. To have a legacy. Yeah. Hmm. So what? You, so what you see is the. So you see the point of life to to leave a legacy then, if that's your motivation to do things. Yeah, I suppose it is. I mean, yeah. I might change my mind tomorrow or in ten minutes time, but yeah, my. I mean, what else am I here for? Hmm. To sow well, seeds. To sow seeds for the future. And then I just think to myself, well, who cares anyway? Uh, well, you can also look at it like... If you consider yourself to be a good person uh, and you're more of a positive impact, a positive person in the world than negative, then meaning by existing on the positive side of the spectrum, you increase the overall posit positivity of the human race of the world. You know, if you, you know, if you, if you could average out the scores of positive or negative across the board, then... What do you think that is? What do I think what is? Positive and negative. If you had to put a percentage. Hmm, good question. Well, so what... what so, uh, I don't, actually, I don't understand the question. <laughs> what do I think what the, the, positive is? The positive, the positive, <coughs> you say the positiveness in the world versus the negativeness. Well, what's the score? The, yeah. Oh, I think generally positive. I mean, I yeah, I think you're generally on the positive side because uh, because that's who we are. As a, that's how we've survived. Like, if we were on the negative side, it would mean yeah. less people surviving than being born. But, yeah, more people dying than surviving. More people killing than surviving. Basically, the numbers of the human race would be getting lower. Like, it's in our interests to grow as a society to get on with each other to a point where we're, you know, like tri that's why we're tribal, right? To to mm. to exist together and, and move forward positively, posit positively in a way that reduces the likelihood of us dying, increases the likelihood of us being able to breed and increases the likelihood of, of those offspring we have surviving long enough to breed themselves is basically what it is. That's how like evolution works and it's, and that's why the laws of attraction exist and why we're attracted to certain things and why we're put off by other things. So, you know, it's, uh, it's probably the, probably the underlying, like the underlying, the thing that the foundation of all our instincts we have, everything, majority of it is guided by the need to breed and no, I know it sounds, but in, in the need <laughs> no, to no, produce offspring to produce, and yeah. to uh, and in a uh, in and maintain an environment in which they are likely to survive themselves and breed. And then you introduce medical. <coughs> then you introduce what? Medical 
progress, evolution that keeps us all alive. And then we become too many. Oh uh, yeah, well it's definitely we're overrun. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. It's like we've we I think you know the what like our carnal desires, you know. I mean, carnal, in, carnal, in, in, like in plays, like sexual urges. Isn't it? I mean, but I mean, our instinctive desires and urges and needs to do whatever, you know, eat, sleep, chip, chug. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they, they <clears throat> that we have now. Do you think that's more for men than women? What shagging? Well, I think it's a mix, isn't it? I don't know. I think it's. I mean, promiscuity is more for more men than women. More women than men. More men than women. Do you think? Pr promiscuity, yeah, mm. yeah. Uh, I mean, again, it's, it's fascinates me. Really? Yeah, I've, it really I've does. I've been reading a lot, of, a lot about it over the last. I say a lot about it. I've been reading about it over the last six months. A couple of things on it because. I, 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 it, what's the one I'm reading at the minute? Uh, the evolution of desire, and it, it's, okay. and it literally talks about why we are attracted to things we're attracted to men and women mm. and how it is rooted in uh, like our ancestry mm. our ancestry um so that's I, interesting it is it, generational i tell you what it is, it is fucking fascinating yeah it is it is because so the point i was making just now is like the world has moved so fast like we've we've evolved not evolved our capabilities have yes. gone so have moved so quickly over the last a couple of hundred years, yeah. hundred years, 50, 10 years, rapid, right? But our our brains have are still five hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, <laughs> ten thousand years ago in terms of our needs and beliefs know. systems. <clears throat> our needs and belief systems, yeah, yeah, you know. And I mean, prime example is th there's a reason that we've had to over the last 20 years, like in the UK, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years in the UK, had to make a conscious effort to treat women better. Mm. There's a reason we've had to do that because we were treating them, we were treating women poorly compared to men, but we were doing that because that's how it was. That's how we needed to be, as in years ago. And I'm not making excuses for it, but now we've gone to a position where we are, it doesn't need to be like that. The woman doesn't need to stay. The woman can care for a child and the man can care for a child and the woman can still have a job and go out and do things. It wasn't, didn't used mm. to be like that, you know. So literally in, in when in our, our ancient ancestors, you got to, th if you think about w what women are attracted to and what to look for on a man, you know, I'm, I'm going to just generalize like physically capable, mm. physically capable, healthy, got resources or is probably going to have access to resources in the future um, and is willing to share those resources, right, with her and her kids mm. and is not likely to fuck off as soon as they've had sex. Mm. Because the, like, again, difference in the woman and the man, I, I think, I think this is a really important part of why men are more promiscuous than women and women are much more or less likely to do it because they need to, they need to be, to have a man around for longer, the man the, have, you have a man around for longer when they have their kids. So it's not just the case of nine months, and they have the oh, again. Let's think back years and millennia, right? Not millennia, but they have they get pregnant, right? Mm. They gradually become less and less capable of defending themselves or finding enough food for themselves mm. over nine months, right? Whilst at the same time needing more because they've got another human growing inside of them. They have the baby. That's not where it stops. They've got another two or three years where that, that child is dependent on them. On them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so breastfeeding is one aspect. The child can't, it's like literally, it's four years, three, yeah, three or four years of that female cannot look after herself on her own and raise a child. So it's in their interest to mm. find the, a man, have baby, man sticks around, a man who's willing to share his food, go out and do all the foraging, fighting, defending, hunting, bring it back, care for the mother, care for the child, feed him until that child. That's that's like the promiscuity thing. That's why mm. it's not important to men. Like it isn't. Imp There's only one. So <sighs> there is important to men to stick around a woman in terms of the ensure that their, their offspring is raised mm -hmm. and survives. Again, we're talking historically here, but they can fuck off after that. You know what I mean? Back in the day, it's like, that's kind of it, done. 
Well, they probably yeah. did fuck off anyway. Yeah. Um, they've got to go to work, haven't they? Yeah. Or, or they've got to bring in money or hunt for food or whatever it is. Yeah. Or... yeah. So, I mean, that's, you know, it's a, the, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll share the book with you. It's, are you... Are you on, it's, it's on Kindle, I'll share it with you. Oh, sure. it's, um, it's great. I love reading about it because it just explains a lot of why we think what we think and why we do what we do. Yeah. Why we're attracted to certain things. It's know? See, I'm, I'm fascinated because I, I don't have kids myself, but obviously I have friends that have children and, and men and women. And the, it's really hard for both genders, I think. So the well, women, it, because the women is going through a massive identity change huge that she's not ready for essentially it just is sort of sprung upon you isn't it really you mean when you have a child yeah, yeah. um and then they lose the what they were there's uncertainty there for her isn't there and then then the, the difference becomes when there's when there's money involved and now we're at this sort of stage in society where I think back in the 90s it was the woman who can have it all and the and the, <laughs> you know I've got the baby and the job and I'm a CEO blah 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 whatever like that's mega that's massive that's a huge huge task I I think and I and then a, a lot of my girlfriends now they're in a position where they feel bad for choosing to be a mother and they have to get over the shame of what society places on them for just wanting to be a mother. Like I met, I went, I went to this party the other day and it was all women and they were, I was the only one who wasn't um, a mother. And I felt, I was really sad because this one lady, I said, oh, what do you do? She goes, oh, I'm just a mum. I was like, you're not just a mum. Are you kidding me? <laughs> like, I I just couldn't think of anything worse than being a mum, to be honest. That's that, but that's me. That's different. But I was just thinking, no, that's so much more important. But then, on the other hand, when I was a kid, I mean, a hugely patriarchal traditional family I'm from. That's why I'm quite confused. But <laughs> <laughs> but my mum was a mother, stayed at home, looked after the house, did a wonderful job. And as my brother and I were getting older, she wanted to go out, do a bit more stuff. And my dad was just like, well, this is new, you know, but why should she stay at home? Her job's done. And then they split up eventually. Yeah. <laughs> they split up eventually. And then um, mum went to work. But then all of a sudden, I found myself having way more respect for my mum for going out to work. And I was like, oh, that's quite interesting because she was then more than just a mum in my <coughs> eyes like so it's weird how it goes and then you've got the the dads who f feel so much pressure and I do wonder why if if this is maybe something to do with male suicide is that they do have this historical um historical sort of need I guess to provide like I know my dad did, and I know that I've spoken to a couple of other chaps who feel a huge amount of pressure to provide for their family because they've made the decision that the wife will stay at home and look after the children. But then, you know, as the children start going to school, the wife may still be going out for lunches and having this lovely life and going shopping and all of that. And her husband's killing himself at work to try and provide for this, this life. And so I think it's really hard. I think it's really, really hard. Yeah, it's definitely. I mean, it's definitely hard on both sides. I agree, but yeah. so, you made a, you made a good point. You know, on, on the uh, on the pressure on pressure that some women, I, I, I assume, feel you know, feel of um, of having to go and be, you know, uh, give up, th like step away from the the traditional gender role. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, applied to women. But this is the thing. But, when you look at these like statistics about males and females and position of power and and um, and like things like the gender pay gap and all of that, it, as I was just sort of talking mm. about, it's literally rooted. It's rooted in us the way what we desire to do, what we think is right, and what we want to do, and what drives us forward, and motivates us. So women, is it like they instinct is to raise children like je i'm generalizing I yes, I'm not a woman, but, but, <laughs> yeah no but that's why most that's why most um it's one of the reasons you know why most women who raise children they, they will have a part-time or one of a job at all 
and it's, I'm not saying that's correct. Like the way the way it should be is as it is like right now. You know, if a woman wants to go and have a normal job, a, a normal career, or I say normal, have a career like she thinks a man can have, right? Well, she should be able to go and have the opportunity to do so. Yeah. At least, uh, yeah, and have no unnecessary barriers there, which is why we have the Equality Act and the laws and, and, and legislation, and they are amazing. But they shouldn't, you shouldn't be dragged across the coals if you don't want to do that. I can't agree all, more. It's literally why the human race exists. Like women, literally, they produced every single human being on this planet. Yeah. Women did that, you know, so. So it's weird that that sort of goes disrespected in a way. I don't think it's weird. I think it's, do you know, I don't know. I think it's weird. It's just, it's another, it's another example of, it's another example of something being thrown up as a real problem in society. No, a problem being thrown up in society, like let's say 60s, 70s, when women couldn't vote and we realised, mm. oh my God, yeah, we, we should treat women better, right? But it's gone too far. As in, it's, it's gone too far. As in, we've like legislated, it's in law. You cannot fucking treat a woman any differently because she's a woman. You're not allowed to do it. And look how incredible opportunities women have now, right? Totally. Exactly. What's, when I say it's gone too far, I mean to the point you just said, women getting vilified because they want to they wanna be, um, be at a home, mum. be a mum. No. Yeah. No. Let, let them, let people make their own choice, you know, and ensure that they've got equal opportunities. Which is also really hard because, look, I think it's very clear that a lot of women do not have the high paying jobs and it's very difficult for them to do that with looking after children. So a lot of my girlfriends as well, they can't go to work because it doesn't make financial sense. Mm. You know, they're going to work and they'd only make £20 a day after childcare. And they're like, sorry, what's the point? There's definitely that? still problems. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I had uh, a lady called Rachel Body on and she's a nurse, ex-military and she's a nurse. And I think we talked on and off there about the challenges she has in trying to get employment that will pay you enough to one earn money and we will pay enough to manage the childcare side she's a single mum yeah and it's just it's just ma still massive barriers there mainly childcare cost yeah. mainly childcare costs um in that example but it's you know it's still work to be done in some areas do you know but, i think that's what's sort of slightly different in the i mean maybe this is another generalization <coughs> but it, it was a conversation that we had in the desert and um with beda and athea and what tends to happen in there, because the families all live together more, it's more of a collective society than an individual society, which is what we are, that you just have automatic childcare because you've got a, a, a grandmother or a great grandmother or an auntie, you know, or a maid, a housemaid to look after the child so the mum can go out to work. So it's almost like there's more, there's more family support in those collective societies than what there is here. Interesting though that, I mean, let's take, we're talking about the Arabian Peninsula, right? Interesting mm. though that in those societies, they are generally, some of them, are, a lot of them are generally more oppressive to women. Yeah. Where it, there could be more opportunity. Okay, so this is something that was interesting about being in the desert is that, and this was a conversation we had that's going to be in the film, um, is the fact that I, I came from the patriarchal family. I was like, you know, it's my dad ruled the roost. Beda and Athea's mums were the breadwinners. So Beda's mum was actually, oh. yeah, I know, it really turned things on its head. So Beda's mum was divorced when Beda was very young, and that was like a no no, apparently. So she was kind of. Um, Are they Muslim? Yeah. yeah. So she was almost a bad egg because of it and so they didn't really socialize outside because it's like oh a divorced woman she must be terrible whatever a threat whatever and so she had this very strong female um role model who brought her and her sisters up provided them with a house a job and so she so Beda never thought she wouldn't work or never thought she wouldn't provide for herself because she had that very strong role model. And equally, Athea's mother was um, the breadwinner. I think her, da her dad works in the police, but Athea's mother had started a very big medical practice around the Middle East. And she was the one that worked all the hours, you know, and, and Athea barely saw her. So it was, 
it was the opposite. Mm. But there's no doubt, I think, that the patriarchal systems still exist. Of course they do. And they do here probably as much as they do there. But it it just seems more obvious over there. And, and the, It seems the, more visible and the there. Har- the, like the harsh reality is it will continue to exist yeah. in some guys for as long as women are the only ones that can have babies. That, that, you know, it's like, yeah. that, that, that's it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah. But it's back to the point. There, there shouldn't be any sort of... Uh, there shouldn't be any... There should be every measure done by society to enable opportunity if you want to go for it. Yeah. You know, equal opportunity for women. I, I totally agree with that. But going back, it's just... But it's hard, hard to do that. But people, but people <laughs> want to bitch about everything at the moment. Oh, pardon uh, that expression. We, right? but people, <laughs> want to, but people, want to, people want to bitch about everything at the moment for well, some we're human. reason. We're whingers. And they want, to, they want to attribute blame to some part of society. Well, they want to attribute blame for a, another problem, which normally doesn't exist, or is based on false premise, to white people, right, or male people. I'm just generalising when we talk about things like this, yeah. you know. It's like... Uh, the, another one, I, this is why I started reading The Evolution of Desire, yeah. because it pissed me off that they were saying, one of the narratives, I say they were saying, one of the things is like uh, makeup and women dressing like in attractive clothing yeah. and skirts and heels and all that, and yeah, makeup is because is basically a, a, a social construct because men... X, Y, Z reason, whatever. I think I don't think that I don't I didn't think that was the case. I think, nah, it's not that because I heard, I think I heard Peterson maybe say something about lips looking red and it resemble and it, it, it no it wasn't Peterson resembles certain parts of the anatomy and certain times things like this. I was reading the book and yeah. makeup as an example. One of the reasons that's come about makeup isn't a new thing that happened over the last couple of centuries. Like women trying to improve the way their skin looks has been around for thousands and thousands and thousands of years and one of the reasons is is because poor skin so again attractive things what men look for in, and women look for in men one example and i'm just generalizing is healthy looking skin yeah skin that is uh, usually skin that is like uh got um not not different colors it's like a, a constant color across it whichever Porcelain. color it is yeah, yeah yeah no a constant color across it not not pockmarked anything yeah. like this because poor like skin that doesn't look healthy is an indicator of potential illness or not great genes and i'm i'm well, breeding basically again breeding i'm and people getting fucking angry listen to me i'm talking about evolution from thousands of years ago and why we attracted certain things that's how makeup came about that is literally one of the main reasons makeup exists it's just makeup has evolved and and now where we live in this like where capitalism is that want by members of society like women Mm. in this example to make their skin look better has been pounced on and you've got all crazy stuff, you know, like, it's why there's a million different lipsticks. It's why a million different, you know, yeah. blushes and concealers and all the rest of it. It's just, you know, it's just all, and it's you know, far and beyond now just the case of making your skin look healthy. It's making your skin look very different. But that's, you know, yeah. it's the, that's the makeup side of things. It's or plumping your lips up or your eyebrows or whatever. There's Botox all, and there's, filler. and There's all sorts of stuff that goes on, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, really and interesting. I just got to grow old. I, I mean, sometimes it breaks me and I look at my skin and I think, oh, it's getting a bit thinner now. But then I just think I just I just want to age like I look at Judy Dench, Helen Mirren, you know the older ladies who are just they own it, Boxes. don't they? They own Boxes. it. Yes. And I'm like, oh, I want to be like you yeah. <laughs> you know. And they're powerful in them in their age. And that's what that's what I I want to age into like that. Mm. And I'm going I'm doing it quite well. I'm going grey, I'm new le- I can't be bothered. Mm-hmm. I'm also lazy. I'm also really, really lazy with beauty stuff. Like, I can't be bothered. I only have my nails done. And that is so that um, it looks as... If you have your nails done, it always looks like you take care of yourself. You always look neat and tidy, no matter what you've got on. Mm. That's you know, that's really interesting. Do you know one of the things I... So, where was I recently? I can't say where I was. I was somewhere. and um, Why can't you say where you were? I can't. 
Okay. If I was somewhere and there was a person that I was speaking to, me and someone else was speaking to, and this person was in a position of authority in the place they were at. Okay. Uh, long story short, his fingernails were really, really dirty. Oh. Really dirty. We're at the place we were really dirty. And uh, and I remember coming away and thinking, hmm. you know things you you now understand because of situations you've been in yourself, for example, or you've or whatever. Yeah. That I thought, hmm, there's a screw loose there somewhere. There's, there is 100% a screw loose there somewhere, either minor or major. Yeah. Because that's you know you're at your place of work, you're meeting people for an important meeting, and your fingernails are stinking dirty. You know, in it, like a, it was a let's say like a, kind of like an office environment. It was not where I, my it was yeah. not on my day job. It was not where I work. It was outside of that. Yeah. Um, but I think hmm, he's got a screw loose somewhere, or he's not well. Like literally thought that. Yeah. You know, it's the because you or or you might say, God, excuse me, I've been working on my car. Forgive my filthy fingers or something, wouldn't you? No, you know, and you can tell when just dirt filth. is ingrained and it's there from something else. You can tell, can't you? Yeah. You you can and you can tell in the same it's like vein. Pervy you, can you can tell, just tell. Yeah, you can tell where it's filthy and there's been no effort made to clean those hands. Yeah. As an example, you know. And the reason I, I pinged it like that, and I didn't think of him in a bar way, I thought, ah, oh, interesting, because I I do think it's a school loose there somewhere. Yeah. Um just like a I don't know how to explain it. Just a just a, a just different odd. personality, yeah. But I think myself when like my mental ill health, I wasn't that hygienic all the time yeah you know i've spoken about the podcast before there i would go days without brushing my teeth crazy yeah. i would want to brush my teeth twice a day and i was a grown man this is just one Something's of the things wrong, and i it? was a grown man and sometimes i sometimes I wouldn't brush my teeth all day or it would be the afternoon before i brush them now that you know to some people that might think you may think oh <laughs> you shouldn't be able to do that it's just fucking lazy no 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 that's an indication of how ill i was at yes. the time you, you need to brush your teeth twice a day. Yeah. Right? At least once. And you should do it first thing in the morning because yeah. your mouth's been fucking Clunch. got all night. Mm. And I wasn't doing that. When was that you know, and you know, my, my the washing was piling up in the sink. All of those things. You know, you, yeah. walk, you walk into the house of someone and the house is a shit tip. You know, and you think, hmm. Yeah. It's not. There's something up here. Yeah. Especially there's if there's not kids. Up. If it's, there's not it's, young kids and yeah, it's just yeah, yeah. gross. Well, no, I mean, yeah, there's something up, you know. So, yeah. uh, how do we get onto that? Uh, fingernails. Yeah, how do we get onto that, though? Don't know. Oh, makeup. Oh, makeup. 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 I mean, yeah. I'm, saying, I'm not saying we shouldn't wear makeup. I like fucking no, well, some men wear, wear makeup, makeup now, if you want don't to. They? Say again. Some men wear makeup oh, now. Oh, well, there is... we go. Prime example of jumping on the bandwagon, capitalism, just getting amongst it. And... Yeah. <sighs> But also, I was having a chat the other day about this, because, look, I do feel completely confused about the world at the moment and what people are and this identity thing and this um, transgender gender and all of that. But the thing is, it's been around for so many years anyway. And, like, you know, you go to Thailand and it's all very, it's very normal. It's not, a, <coughs> this isn't a new thing. Is it just the fact that that some transgender people, people have felt bullied or or... Alienated mm. or something like this. I'm, I'm well, trying to understand. Well, one of the understand. things that happens is you have waves of. One of the things that happens is you have waves of, um, of, like, uh, what's the word? Like a psych, it's like a infectious, contagious. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what the right word to use is, but psychological, psych, psychological situations that happen but they they happen in waves right so you know people uh thinking or feeling they're they should be a different gender to what they are to your point always been around mm. always been around like homosexuality always been around you know people who want to dress as the other gender but not necessarily live as the other gender always been always been around but you have waves of it mm. if you think back to and it and it becomes contagious so if you think back to the 80s like, yeah, eighties. Homosexuality was it was like it was huge, like a massive wave of it. wasn't wasn't existing yeah. in the seventies. wasn't existing. I mean, it existed, but it wasn't like shit loads of people all of a sudden in your face be gay. I'm not slagging off people who are homosexual. I'm saying My dad always attracted sixty seventies. Yeah, so eight, eight, eighties. <laughs> yeah, through the roof. Yeah, nineties. Transsexuals. 
that was a huge thing in the nineties. You know, you think if you think about these things, you think they are the they are the times you think about. Yeah. And it was um, you could go back to um, the sixties, like promiscuity through the Free roof, love. contagious. And it, they, they have these waves, and we're in a wave. We're in a wave now with it, with especially with um, you know transgenderism. One hundred. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not. It, I'm just saying this is what happens. Yeah. But it is a. I'm going to use the word psychosis that's incorrect. It is contagious. The more it yeah. appears to be, the more you see of it, then the more people who may be having, uh, maybe in a certain mind state, think it's where they want to be. Um, yeah. As in, oh, I, that, is that maybe that's it. It's that ripple effect, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. It's and the... that's what I'm not, I'm just saying that is, that, that situation exists. Yeah. And that's where we are now. You know, it just happens to be at a time where the world is just fucked anyway. Oh, just dear. You know. I try, I try not to watch the news or pay too much attention, to be honest, because I find that it really gets me down mm. and I, it, it upsets me sort of thing, you know, because I just would like to live sort of very equitably with my neighbours and for everyone to live. And unfortunately, that's not the way it is, is it? But No, do you know what? It's, it's harder to navigate now as well because because there is def like people are definitely less willing to air their opinions their opinions about things that frightens me definitely well i i do i i, I do it on the podcast and recently i've, I've been I've, you know we talked a lot about ukraine Fucking hell, look what we've just been talking about now yeah. you know we mentioned race we're talking about um yeah. sexism and sexual uh gender equality transgenderism all of these things but and like i do worry about it because you get the wrong person listen to it totally and they get the wrong i say i worry about it i do worry about it because i've you know i've got i, I work but i I'm, i just it's important to discuss the topics, and I do it because I want to inform my own understanding of things. Yeah, for you sure. Um, I, I I don't understand why we're so frightened to talk about this stuff. I, yeah, so on that, and I do it because I want other people to, to not be afraid of discussing it. Yeah, like, I'm not afraid of discussing it. There are people listening to what you and I are saying now, and don't agree. They don't agree. It's fine. They're absolutely fine. I don't expect you to agree with me. Most of what I say is bullshit. Bullshit. Sometimes Stupid. I don't agree yeah. with myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. It, is, it is interesting. I was talking to my brother about it this morning, actually. And um, my, um, again, I know I talk about my dad a lot, but so dad, he, he always sort of championed the underdog a little bit. And his growing up in South London, like back in the 70s, 80s, whatever, it was racist. It was. Okay. But his best mate was a Muslim and another black guy. He took on, so dad had this uh, roofing firm and he took on this, um, this young black kid called Derek, I think his name was, I think Sam said. And, and everyone used to call, call him Monkey Derek or Monkey Boy, you know? And um, apparently my dad was the only, this that came out of the funeral, is that Derek said, your dad always just told me to fuck them. <laughs> he said, don't listen to them. And, and gave him a chance. But he gave him a chance because he was a good person. Not because he was black or what, it's just because he was a good person. Judge people on merit, right? He yeah. Judge people on merit. This is what bothers me at the moment, is people, I don't think there's merit. And sometimes, you know, even, there was a conversation about Toastmasters I used to do at the HAC, and it was wanting to get people... <clears throat> wanting to get women into the committee or whatever in Toastmasters and I said okay that's fine but are there women in the pool to pluck out and they were like no I was like well what you it's tough luck then isn't it you know you can't you can't magic these things they no. have to be in the mix yeah to be in the mix yeah this, things go things so back to my point earlier about things going full circle things go, uh, are going too far so the situation we're in at the minute where you know we want we want gender equality and sexual equality right where things have gone so far at the minute it doesn't exist yeah. and there are there are situations and there's even there's situations at the moment where there 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 is a sex which is totally a disadvantage disadvantaged in certain circumstances and it's blokes in certain circumstances you know and and that's a, created by going too far, you know. How do you feel about being a white man at the moment? I wouldn't want to be, uh, <laughs> like, I wouldn't want to be one at the moment. I really um, wouldn't. No, I feel, I feel, like... I feel fine. And, and and the reason is, I think, because of where, where I am, literally, geographically, yeah. Yeah. where I work, um, and the circles I'm with. I don't, I don't feel disadvantaged, but I can see where there would be disadvantages yeah. to be, you know, uh, to be a white 
bloke at the same time, I think I, I, it's almost something I don't want to create noise about. Yeah. Because, again, again an example of going too far, you know, there are, there's, a thing in, there's a thing in South Africa, and I'm going to, so I've got a, my next guest after this is a South African guy, and he mentioned this when we first met, and I wanted to pick his brains more about it, and we call it over here positive discrimination. Yeah. In South Africa, they call it, I think it's a, an affirm, affirmative action jobs so there's so over there and i'm I'll, you know, i'm sure you'll correct me when i speak to him on the next podcast but uh there's jobs where if you apply and you're you're black you are prioritized over white people right right now i think that is fucking terrible yeah because what you're doing is you are disadvantaging a group because of their skin color mm -hmm. is, which is exactly what you're trying to stop so it shouldn't be that what it sh what it should be is rules in place to ensure that you're not allowed to discriminate against someone because of their skin color regardless of skin color regardless yeah. of skin color you shouldn't be allowed to um to discriminate against a black person just because they're black they should have the same way to apply for a job and be treat and be again judged on merit qualifications experience all the rest of that mm -hmm. compared to any other skin color but it's not the case the uh, positive discrimination that we have over here it is inherently a racist um a, a racist um initiative because yeah. against your point if there's quotas to meet then it disadvantages people of who are not in that quota yeah anyone who's not a woman for example in the quote you want to meet in your example there yeah you know what you, yeah, it, what, it, or, or what if there are no black people yeah, or Indian uh, ex, people in exactly. Toastmasters? Or well, they don't want to. It's like, yeah, yeah. It's like I, I, know. And I understand that, you know, we're in a situation where, regardless of whether we're talking about sex or whether we're talking about race, we're in a situation where, you know, there are some industries and some jobs and some whatever circumstances or uh, environments where there are more than category A than category B because of historical biases that shouldn't have existed. But if you if you stop where we are now and say, right, we've there are laws in place to prevent these kind of discrimination, over time they will it will peter out. So you do get like equal balances of people where they want mm. to be. You're never gonna have ever, ever, ever gonna be a fifty fifty split in like uh pay for men and women. Never going to be 50 50, equally paid on both. It'll be, it'll be one way or the other. It's never going to be 50 50 because we've got different in, different intents, different uh, mm. motivations. It's the same on same as skin colour. It's like, who was I talking to about this? Um, uh, uh, last year, I think it was talking, I think it might be my cousin. And she asked, she was talking about most, she was saying, of the top 40 richest people in the UK, something like 35 of them are white five of them are black mm. or non-white she was saying it in, i think it was my cousin i'm sorry i live it wasn't you but um and she, she given it as an example mm. of institutional racism in inverted commas no most of the uk is white most of the yeah. uk is white so by definition most of anything here most things you can see it's going to be white because that's yeah. the breakdown and I'm, again i'm not saying this is the case for every situation i'm not saying racism doesn't exist but it, as an example you go to africa you know to who the, what color of the top 40 richest how, how many of the like the premiers in africa are black most of them are black it's not because they're racist towards whites it's because most people in africa are black yeah. you know it's it yeah. but these these discussions and topics you won't ever see the, these things brought up in the media because they don't it's not of interest in terms of generating well no maintaining they're... the argument and generating in uh generating sales you know pisses me off it, well it's very divisive i think the way they the way the media handle it all. I don't like it. I think generally people just knock around, don't they? I mean, I remember going to, um, I stayed with my friend in Tel Aviv um, and he took me to, oh God, it was just when they, they were um, bombing it as well. Um, and I, he took me to the old, was it the old city? God, I just can't. Anyway, where Arabs, Christians, every, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, that's yeah. it. No, was it? Bethlehem. I can't remember. Bethlehem. 
wherever it was anyway it was where everyone was knocking about together you know yeah. and the issue wasn't on the ground the issue is with the leadership and that power yeah. struggle that everyone else is just getting on i mean i don't know but then i do you know i see kind of everything with rose tinted spectacles as well as i don't I, I want to see it like that but you know i suppose in some places i've never experienced it with men and women really <coughs> i mean sometimes you do get sort of snide comments or whatever and people underestimate you but so what people do that to everybody some people do that to everybody um and i tend to just ignore it really um but i've never really been sort of a victim to any proper sexism or no but the thing is i mean you and know, that's, so uh, i can talk like this it does happen yeah, doesn't of course it? It i mean does. The, to your point i think it does, on the grassroots level of society i think we're fine people aren't hating each other sexism is petering out racism is petering out it you know but you, to watch the news, you'd think it's a major, major, major drama. I mean, the litmus test, and I'm not, again, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, right? Um, but, you know, the litmus test is what do you see when you walk out around places? Yeah. What do you see when you go into the supermarket? Where you're, uh, what do you see when you're anywhere with a lot of people around? What does it feel like? You know, what does it look like? Not what are the breakdown of people there, what they, you know, male, female, black, white, whatever color, whatever, whatever sex. It's like, how are they interacting? Mm. Are you observing any sexism? Are you observing any racism? You know, maybe occasionally, infrequently, but you're gonna get you're gonna get assholes. Mm -hmm. you're gonna, but again, as as the, like we're moving forward positively in the next generation. So that like the generation before ours was pretty racist. You know, oh yeah, on, compared to us. You know, well, again, and, was terrible. and sexist, and sexist. It, but you know, in the seventies, the what yeah. was it? Seventies women could vote. 60s, 70s, that happened. Something like yeah, that. Yeah, and, and again, should, like laws like... around homosexuality and all of that stuff, that was only the genera generation yeah, before Alan us. Yeah, Alan Turing, he, he got killed, didn't he? Yeah, Alan Turing, 50s. And, and that was only the generation before yeah. us. The point I'm making is that they're, like, they're dying. And I hate saying this, because we know people of that generation, right? Yeah. And when they disappear, that's like, a, I don't, I'm not saying get rid of them now. What I'm saying is the bad apples in that generation are gone and that that they are not having the impact on society so you know for the generation when we are old I, I know but too i know hang on but when we're old you think you think growing up as a kid in 40 years time the oldest generation in the uk is going to be people like us who've lived through this knowing how much effort there's been to make to minimize discrimination for whatever reason maximize the opportunity equal equal opportunities for people we're going to be old people the generation below us think how good it's going to be then it'd be like racism would be something you're like what people used to treat people there were laws that said you couldn't do this if you had a different skin color you're like yeah I'm telling you Bunkers. not me but your great granddad he yeah. lived in that time you know let me tell you what your great grandmother used to say about you know indian people or you know men or you know or gay people yeah. that's what it's going to be that's what i think is good you know but this going too far and bringing in things that discriminate against discrim the positive discrimination yeah. for example be it sex or be it race it, it perpetuates the hate the perceived hate for each other or the resentment for each other it perpetuates it i agree well, i like run there no George, you're feeling better lighter no because no, I'm saying it on air <laughs> <laughs> okay but I do think there are still um, some some areas which are so there's so much hate ingrained in them that even when the next generation yeah, dies yeah. it remains yeah. because it's it gets in you doesn't it like it's what your belief systems are your core belief systems true. as a child growing yeah, up and that's all you know and all you see yeah, and I you're am. not exposed to anything else that's what you yeah, believe i mean yeah i mean i am commenting from a point of I, i'm not i haven't grown up in that yeah. environment i don't see that environment i mean well you mentioned jerusalem just now you know there are you know there's two different peoples there israelis yeah. and palestinians and they hate each other and they hate each other you know talk about um ribbon peninsula you talk about islam talk about christianity talk about China, Northern just, Ireland, just, Northern Ireland, Glasgow. What about Glasgow? Go on. 
Glasgow's like the same as Northern Ireland. The Rangers and Cal Celtic. Oh, that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't realise how bad it was there. Stupid. I mean, like, I just... Well, how, go on, how bad is it then? Yeah, it's pretty bad, because I was up there doing some work, wasn't I, with the Rangers. I don't know. Were you? Oh, my God. What I, were you doing? I did the biggest... Life thing. modelling for the football team. <laughs> no, you must be joking. <laughs> There's no um, paintings going on that canvas. <laughs> no. yeah. There's literally, they are, um, they're, it's tribal. It's a football, you know, it's still the Protestant, is it they're still the Protestant? I don't know enough about Catholics it, and but Catholics yeah. and Protestants. Yeah. And it was bad back in the day, and I think it still is now. You know, they have to limit the, the amount of different... I mean, they have the, the game called The Firm or something where it's the one that they play against each other. And, like, you know, if... Yeah, what is that? What is it called? I can't remember. The, dar the Derby. What Do you it? know what I did, though? What? I was in... <laughs> I was working for this drink and I was in charge of the Twitter. Um, and when there was Rangers games on and stuff, I was going, good luck, Rangers, and I put the clover on. And I got a message. <laughs> I oh my god, the no shamrock. One. I had no idea. And because we were on Rangers side, yeah, supporting them. And I put the shamrock oh, so on. So they were sponsoring the team? Yeah. Oh my god. And I put the shamrock on. And oh apparently, all of the Rangers thing, they were saying, you need to sort out your social media, <laughs> whoever's doing that. And I got a very sweet message from someone just saying, look, I'd highly advise that you take your last tweet down. <laughs> oh, no. oh my god. <laughs> I know. Oh Goodness dear, me. oh dear. I do I I have a I have a I have a, a deep dislike for football. I, I like the sport. Yeah. I like the as in the actual play in the sport. I've never been a great footballer, yeah. but I enjoy playing it. I can watch a game. But the sport as a business, oh my god. I despise it. I, <laughs> Why? My kids went and played football. Yeah. My kids started youth, just youth football, you know. Yeah. And um, I ended up being, a, I ended up becoming a coach. Uh, but the, the team spent more time with them. It was not long after the, I got divorced. I was getting divorced and stuff, so I wanted to spend be around them as much as I could. Mm. And um, it just exposed me to how bad that 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 football is set up and why, and um, like some of the reasons why you get this horrendous. Just the supporters. Why you have to, why you have to segregate supporters in the stands? You can't you can't put Celtic fans next to Rangers yeah. fans. They and not just, I mean that's an extreme example. We could, they don't do it at any game. Like there's yeah. always segregation of the fans from each other. Rugby's the complete opposite. And the way the way the players are t on the pitch, the, the the way they treat the ref, like Jesus, yeah. what they can get away with, Jesus it's Christ, you know. Isn't it? the, the again the hooliganism. I'm not saying all football supporters are hooligans, but the hooliganism aspect of it. When I started coaching at the youth level, um, I grew up in rugby. You know, you can stand on the edge of the pitch and all the all the crowd stands mm. you can stand together you can cheer on the game whether that's an international game or whether you're at a club level you know all the teams go to a clubhouse afterwards and go out and they have food the, whoever's hosting the game puts food on free food for the players the players all sit in the same place the parents and supporters all drink and everything's maybe the occasional fight but everything is fine football my god <laughs> you have to have uh, you have to have this is FA rules. Around the football pitch, whatever level, you have to have um, a, a physical barrier. So it can be just tape, for example, you know, like mine tape or you know, yeah. red and white tape. A physical barrier that's two metres away from the side of the pitch. Spectators are not allowed to go closer than that barrier. They, it's rules, right? If a, rug, if a football club doesn't follow that, they get fined by the FA, right? right. For example, don't put the barrier up. Not allowed to do that. Um, if, a, if a football club player if a player of one of the you know, club wants to move this i'm just trying to think of the mm. examples i can remember wants to move from one team to another let's say it's mid-season i don't want to play for warwick football team anymore i want to play for leamington football club now let's say they're eight years old right mm. and they want to change teams for whatever reason or they're moving they have to pay a transfer fee jenny mm. uh, jenny jenny they have to pay a transfer fee eight years old at every level, transfer fee that goes to the FA, the league in charge of the, the, the league really? within the FA. Yep, transfer. I'm telling you, I was part of the, I was also the child welfare, welfare officer for the club I was at. Transfer fee. Um, what was the other example I was going to give there? 
I mean, this is slightly separate, but on the same vein. Um, when there was, when you had, a, if you had a game, yeah. you were not allowed to publicise the result of the game on social media at all. And if your club did it, you get fined by the FA. So you could say, hey, we had a great game against Leamington FC. Um, looking forward to playing them again. But if you said, great game against Leamington FC, uh, score was 2-0, we won, great win, and such and such scored. Nope, Why? fine. Because it's not about the winning, it's about the taking part. Oh, for God's sake. Uh, serious. No, you weren't allowed to do it. Now, that, that there was... That was definitely the case six years ago. Right. As in that social media, because that was a new thing that came in. I don't know if it still exists now, but it's just madness. So... You have all these things, you know, when you think about, again, that football level, all these fines and stuff and all these fees that the players have to pay and the clubs have to pay to the, the league. I went to a league meeting in the first season there. Uh, I can't remember any teams in this league, but the question came up. They get the financials. They were mm. sitting on something like 96 grand the league had. And the question, what are you gonna, what's the money going to be spent on in the next season? And they couldn't answer. And apparently that question would be cut three times. And it's maybe isolated just this league, but th three years in a row. But the money's getting bumped up. It's not getting spent on anything. So you think about all the money in football. How many mm. football clubs did I go to with my kids that they were playing against had, a, had their own ground with um, a clubhouse? One in the entire time. They don't have clubhouses. Most of them is just a, a, a football pitch in some communal area you go and play on. Yeah. All this money being generated. No attention being paid to, okay, let's play the sport and let's use the money to be cohesive. Yeah. To bring people together. To say, yeah, go and play against each other. Co like, I was going to say combat against each other then. You know, um, compete against each other. And then shake hands and chill out afterwards. Like like rugby yeah. does. And I will go back to, you know, I love the, the sport of rugby for all those reasons, not just because it's a game. And then I wonder with football why you have these this this need to segregate people in the stands because they can't get on this this aspect of it with the hooliganism this disdain for referees and complete lack of respect for the authority on the pitch by players the corruption what about the parents what do you mean what did you how did you find the parents uh if that varied it, it varied on the whole good i mean mm. especially at a young age and it was girls football okay boys football is very very different mainly because of the dads being yeah. super fucking competitive again yeah. it's it's football oh, specific God. it is not the same as rugby it's very very different because it's primarily because it's so driven by money yeah. you know it shouldn't be influenced at the grassroots grassroots level and that's why you have the problems at the top it's an absolute joke it's an absolute joke it's a shame because the, the sport itself is great the yeah. game is great you know it's a great game accessible by everyone you know i mean that's that is the other aspect of it it's more accessible to to people, you don't, you don't, you know, it's harder to play rugby if you haven't got any money. Why? It's less accessible, it takes more to set up. So, Is it? yeah, so it's, it's the re, it's one of the reasons why, like, ask yourself this, why are, why are, look at all the top tennis players, look yeah. at all the female top tennis players. It's no coincidence they're all good looking. Generally, they are good looking women, aren't oh, yeah, they? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. So, one of the reasons is, is that generally they are from more well-off parts of society. They're from a different class. Poor people, to, ugly. Yeah, well, ten, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> tennis courts cost money to set up. Yeah, they take yeah, equipment. Yeah. They need maintenance, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's why. Look at, look at swimmers. It's the same case with swimmers. You don't get swimming mm. pools in the shittest parts of the country or the world where there's not much money. So, yeah. that, so by definition, there aren't swimming pools where people who are less well-off are. Yeah. You see, see what I'm saying? That's why football is so popular. Anyone can play it. Anyone can play it. All you need is a round, a round thing, and the goalposts. Yeah. Rugby, you need. Uh, say a round thing. You need football, but rugby. It's a different shaped ball. Yeah. Yeah. It's different posts. Yeah. You got to kick him over the top. Yeah. It's contact sport as well. Yeah. So which re reduces the amount of people who can play it or want to play it. Yeah. Boxing as well, I expect boxing is quite accessible, isn't it? Well, yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah. I think boxing does yeah. does really That's well. Right. I mean, you, you look at the tennis. It's the, it's the, yeah, it's the yeah. best example of it. It's no coincidence they're all good looking because they're from great gene pools, successful gene pools. People with access to money yeah. and resources goes back to the, goes back to the um, evolution you. of desire talk. 
what's your this is something that i've been quibbling with at the minute what's your definition of success Ooh. <clears throat> Uh, financially stable with with enough savings that um i can i can pay for any major disaster lose my house or lose my car for example and have enough uh enough expendable income to mm. do the things i want to i enjoy doing that that should be what it is is it dynamic what do you mean is your success, is your, your goal, you know, because I think, so. I, I, I don't know if there's one version of success. Yeah, you know, I'm I really giving, did diving into this at the moment, because well, I think I'm driven a lot by what other people's success is, rather than actually what um, my own is. Well, you've got, like, the definition of success, you've also got what's the point of life. So, oh, what's the motivation? Send me down that rabbit hole. The, and they should be two, one and the same, right? But they, yeah, it's, it's so. just a yeah, it's tricky because I don't know if it is. I mean, money is bloody important. What do you want? What do you want people to say about you when you're on your death when you're on your deathbed and you're gone? Like, what do you want people to think about you? She lived her life and she was a good person, and she helped people where she could. So should that not be your definition of success? Because mine is, I just want people to think in general I was a good person. That's it. Yeah. That's it. I think all else aside, was I a good person? That's it. You know, not yeah. not perfectly good the whole Did time. Did she do good. good? You know, okay, then, then that's the that's it. Just be a decent person. Because I'm not decent all the time. No one is. It's right, asshole. Sometimes. Oh, I know. <laughs> it's like, who is it? Who's like? I see it as Brian and Laura, the two sides of my brain, and then there's me that sits on top, and Brian's the total twat. Yeah. But sometimes you need a Brian, and then Laura's the sanctimonious sort of Karen, yeah. essentially, who's sort of always telling Brian off and being, mm, you know, <laughs> bloody dark. So anyway, I watch this sort of charade in my head go on and. You know they battle with each other and it's um it's interesting but the success thing i yeah i'm still i think maybe it is i think for me it's dynamic and it changes you know so there's and it will do because yeah. you change you change and evolve oh, as a very person much. right all the time you think yeah. in five or ten years time totally different thing well knowing you you'll think in five or ten minutes it's totally five different. ten minutes <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> um what's happening with the film so Talk the, about the film. film, okay, Arrowhead. Um, it is, we are at the stage now where we are just working on sound design and colour correction. And we are very close to signing a contract with a global distributor. So I think we will be complete in June, fingers crossed. And then... The film, I think they will start marketing it in, well, after after June, provided it's finished. So, hopefully, we get a we get a sale or a sale or two within the first six months, and hopefully, you'll see it on Netflix. Amazing. With any luck. Amazing. Um, yeah. So, ah, oh, shit. That's been a labour of love. That's that seed was sown. Was it two thousand and? 11 yeah 2011 and it's taken this long was it that long ago was well it... that's when i dated the major the sas guy that showed me the arrowhead oh and you went to oman in 2018 no 20 no i initially went to oman in 2012 that's the first time i ever went there and yeah. that's it got under my skin but we never went to the empty quarter <clears throat> and i was just magnetized to go to i just needed to go to the empty quarter for whatever reason it was i rationalize the reasons now but at the time it was just i need to be there mm. um and now we're here i feel so much i feel in such a a better place probably since well 2019 was the first time i was on here yeah with you and that was i think that was uh, just after i'd come back from the desert yeah. and i th after my dad died as well yeah that's right yeah yeah so and you're still wearing the whistle i'm still wearing the whistle yeah but i've got more things now so this is my this is my um logo and that started from the expedition. Oh, nice. yeah. So it's a, a hourglass. And then this is my my friend bought me this for my fortieth birthday. 
and it's to remind me to stay in my own shell <laughs> and not and not get distracted on other people's exciting paths um so yeah, I sorry, it's sentimental or full but uh yeah so i do i do the the last four years have been a real deep dive reflection and moving forwards and finally growing up i think what are you going to do after the film is done that'll um, be some kind of closure for you that won't it for sure yeah it will Long be time. i need to do that i need to do a book i want to do a book that's on my on my tick list have you started oh yeah i've got it's so hard Why? it's so hard just because there's so many facets to the story there's so much in there and i don't know which bits to pick out which bits to you know and i just how do i structure it um so or you know does it need to be in parts because yeah there's been so much influence into it and so many different people and evolutions and i just i'm really really struggling with it um and i to be honest i haven't picked it up for a year so mm. um I, I get the film out of the way first and then I want to I learned so many fascinating lessons about myself other people about leadership about teamwork about the human condition and I want to share those lessons so I am I am pushing that more to to get into more speaking and and sharing what I I what think I've a book learned. Would be great. I think a book would be great. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I mean, I wrote a diary when I was in the desert, and it's pretty jarring, actually. Um, but Why not publish that then? Well, maybe that's what it's got to be. Maybe I'm over, probably overcomplicating things. I do tend to do that. Yeah. Well, I was talking to my cousin's a, a writer, mm. um, and he was saying years ago I was thinking about doing a book, and a fiction book. And, We've spoken um, about this. Yes, I still think you should. Oh uh, really? Well, well. Uh, I won't do it. Okay. Um, and he was saying, don't deliberate of, over how you, what structure you think it should be. So just, just write, just, just write. Get the first thing done, as in get the first draft done, and then it'll help form, it'll help form how you think the book should be. Because when you start writing, it's going to come out in a different way than you're imagining it now. So just write, just write. I did. Just I write. I've got 50,000 words. Just write till it's done. And then if you want to, you know, move it about a bit and then move it about I, a bit. I, I think I'm thinking... Otherwise you're never going to start. I have started, Hugh. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, 50,000 yeah. bloody words. Oh, you've done 50,000 words. Yeah, I've even oh. submitted it to literary agents. I got rejected, which is fine. I knew that I would because I wasn't oh, I happy with no, it. I've yeah, right, done okay. 50,000 bloody words, but I hate them. And I don't want to rework them. So what I'm thinking is probably the best thing to do. I do my best thinking when I'm walking in the bath mm. or driving. And I think the thing to do is get a dictaphone and just talk it. Just talk it and see what happens and get it whatever that you made into type. Mm. Yeah, speech to text. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, do it. So I think that's what I need to do. Do it. And that will flow better because, you know, like the brain goes so quickly that the fingers can't quite keep up. And yeah. that's a frustration. Yeah, I know. I do. Yeah. I know exactly what you mean. But also, it does give you time to form the words. Think about what you're writing. Yes, it does. Oh, you just wanted to rush and get it done in a second. Just do it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But also, I think um, when I was fully into my writing, I was really depressed at the time. So writing for me was easy then because that was my like go to get out, and then it would bring me out of this dark this darkness but then i felt all the creativity would drain away from me when the when the you know the dark moods left the the poetry left mm. and so i was i was kind of battling with that a little bit as well um so yeah or maybe maybe i just need to sort of find someone who will work with me and we just disappear for a week and get it done. I don't know. I'm just toying with it all. But I, first off, I just need to have this film sorted out yeah. and done, and just yeah. get that off, off the plate first, and not take anything more on. Mm. 
Um, we've got to get out here in a minute because oh, we've, got, we've, okay. got, um, we've got uh, got the food festival. Lovely, haven't Perfect. we? Um, what have, what what do we not cover? How do people? How are gonna, people going to keep track of what's going on with you and the film? Well, I'm just getting all my tech sorted out, so they can visit janiemcgill.com, and that will have a. I will put that link in the blurb. Thank you very much. Yep. That will have all the updates. So I'm really, I'm really trying to get on top of things and, you know, do it all proper like. Proper like. Yeah. Right, cool. Cool. No, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Glad. Um, thank you, Hugh. Yeah. It's always a pleasure. Next time, uh, next time we'll, you'll be in, we'll be discussing the film that has been released and a huge success. And the book. And the book. <laughs> and the book. Yeah, and the book. And the yeah, glittering definitely. speaking yeah. career. And, and the diary. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. No, that's been cool. Nice one. Amazing. Dogs have been good as well, haven't they? Exactly. Yeah, they've been very good, actually. Yes. Very cool. good. Right. Bye-bye, people. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. <laughs>